the topic for our first panel is getting out safely, planning for successful emergency evacuation outcomes. The aim is to empower local jurisdictions and individuals with access and functional needs to develop comprehensive, inclusive emergency evacuation plans that work for the whole community, right? Ensuring that individuals with access and functional needs are able to evacuate their homes safely before, during, and after disasters is essential, but it doesn't happen without proper planning. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So uh, working with us, we've got uh, some panelists. I wanna read just some bios and then I'm gonna ask uh, that, that they come on and, and share. Thank you, Heather and, and Jeff for being here. And, and Sanan, if you wanna join us too. Um, Heather Lafferty is the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion but, and the Access and Functions Coordinator at the Nevada Division of Emergency Management. She's a member of the Nevada Resilience Advisory Committee. And while there, she advocates and supports incorporation and consideration of individuals with disabilities and people with access and functional needs uh, throughout every phase of emergency management. Heather is a grassroots scholar in disability and advocacy and she's the co-creator of the Nevada Access and Functional Needs Working Group. We're also joined by Sanan Khan. Sanan is the Associate Director for the Los Angeles County of Emergency Management. In that capacity, Sanan's responsible for overseeing readiness uh, for the County Emergency Operations Center. Also, all the training and exercises that to happen for operational areas and management of emergency management grants and integration of plans with operational area partners. In his previous role, Sanan served as the operational integration supervisor and the access and function needs coordinator for the LA County of Office of Emergency Services. And our third panelist is Jeff Tom. Jeff graduated from Stanford Law and worked as an attorney for the California legislature for 30 years. He's a past president of the California Council of the Blind and former vice president of the American Council of the Blind. He served in a variety of blindness related capacities uh, and done so at the national, state, and local levels including as a board member of the American Foundation for the Blind and as past president for Disability Rights California and the Alliance on Aging and Vision Loss. But Jeff uh, is a recipient of the 2008 California Public Lawyer of the Year Award. So very distinguished panel. Thank you all for being with us today. Uh, I think what we're gonna do here to start it out is uh, we'll go Heather, Sanan, and Jeff. We will each take about five minutes to, to talk, and then we'll just do uh, some Q&A and have a good dialogue. So Heather, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Vance, for including a rural and frontier state like Nevada in this important discussion around getting out safely. Um, as Vance mentioned, I am Heather Lafferty. I am a white woman with brown hair wearing a blue blouse and an orange sweater. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. You know, uh, one thing, Vance, uh, I'm sure you know about emergency managers is we love a good PowerPoint. Um, so it's refreshing and I'm excited today uh, to get to engage with you and my fellow panelists in a genuine conversation around um, this important topic. You know, look, um, as I mentioned, Nevada is primarily a rural and frontier state with over 28 tribal nations. You know, and many of our communities, we begin the disaster cycle um, underserved and under resourced, um, you know, but you're still expected to rise and provide that same level of services and emergency response, um, you know, as our suburban and urban counterparts, you know, but you're doing it 
um, with much smaller budgets and resources and over a much bigger geographic um, area. You know, and when you factor into that, um, the historic and systemic, you know, exclusion um, in emergency planning for people with disabilities and access and functional needs, you can really start to see the layers of inequity develop, um, which really shines a spotlight on some of those gaps uh, that we're still seeing even today, um, you know, which directly results in, you know, a greater risk of injury and death during a crisis, unfortunately. You know, but before we get too deep um, into our discussion today, I did want to give you a quick um, snapshot of what the continuous disaster cycle of 2023 has really looked like here in Nevada. Um, you know, we were just a few hours into our New Year's Eve celebrations when the first atmospheric river um, event hit northern Nevada, and it dumped an unprecedented um, amount of snow, knocking out power in some cases and places for up to three to four days. Um, then almost immediately, we were hit with the second atmospheric river, um, and we saw, you know, pretty heavy snow impacts in northern Nevada um, and significant flooding in southern Nevada. And we became very concerned um, around uh, our dams and possible dam failures. And then, you know, as we were continuing through January, February, March, um, you know, our April showers did bring May flowers, but they also brought more flooding. Um, and uh, then um, the desert sun started to heat up and you know, now all of that snowpack is melting. So we've entered spring fall and we're seeing more significant flooding, you know, but throughout these events, um, we saw significant impacts, um, isolation, damage, interrupted services uh, to our underserved, you know, frontier and rural tribal communities. We had memory care facilities and assisted living centers, um, you know, lose power. Um, we were very concerned about having to possibly evacuate some of our rural hospitals um, and long-term care facilities. And we were particularly concerned um, also at one point about a camp um, for juvenile clients of Nevada's justice system um, and possible evacuations there. You know, our Walker uh, River Paiute tribe is still actively responding. Um, to flooding events. And at one point, um, our Yamba Shoshone tribe, you know, was completely cut off um, from evacuation and supply routes in and out of their community. Um, so for Nevadans, uh, it's not a question of, you know, if you're going to be impacted by disaster, but when, um, even as we begin, you know, we begin this conversation right now, my emergency managers in Southern Nevada um, you know, are really focusing in on the excessive heat warnings um, because we know, um, you know, on this call in particular, that heat disproportionately impacts and, and affects people with disabilities and access and functional needs. Um, so I'm very excited to get to join everybody today as we kind of hash through some of these best practices for evacuation and planning with the disability community. Thank you, Vance. Awesome. Thanks, Heather. So now let's turn it over to you. So morning, everyone. Vance, thank you for the opportunity for being here this morning. Uh, I'm Sanan Khan. I serve as the Associate Director for LA County Office of Emergency Management. Uh, LA County, small town, 4,000 square miles. Uh, I know everyone thinks uh, a big county, more resources, big county, more disagreements, more issues and coordination. Uh, LA County has a population of around 10 million people, uh, a underestimate uh, based on our census really is an AFN population around 25%, uh, 25% of 10 million, which, um, which we know is an underestimate, is still a lot of people. Uh, prior to my current position, I served as the Access and Functional Needs Coordinator for LA County. Uh, I have to say by far the best job I have ever had, uh, just based on the relationships that we built with our AFN community partners. Uh, yeah, in, in the beginning, there were disagreements, there were differences of opinion, uh, but at the end, it led to just a fantastic collaborative process. A uh, lot of issues in LA County, uh, and I mean, emergencies transition over time, right? When I say a lot of issues, what I mean is 
we were planning for drought, 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 drought. And then it was just nonstop rain and, uh, you know, massive issues with potential paw of uh, the snow and the ice packs. So the transition in planning really needs emergency managers, our community partners, our stakeholders, as well as our community to be very, very reactive and adaptive to the changes that are coming our way. So I'm just going to keep it short for that opening comment because I know there are some amazing discussion questions coming. So Vance, back to you. All right. Thank you, Sanan. Jeff, let's turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to be here today. Thank you, Vance, for this opportunity. I don't have the uh, incredible level of expertise of my two amazing colleagues. Um, but I come to you with lived experience as a person with a disability, in my case, uh, vision loss. And having been part of process of providing advice in California uh, on uh, county plans, I can say it's truly been a, an incredible experience. And I have learned more than I have given, I think. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say that every level of every part of the planning process, uh, whether it's hazard mitigation, um, emergency notifications, evacuations, uh, shelter services or reentry, provides specific issues um, for people with access and functional needs. For those of us in the access and functional needs community, depending upon one's individual circumstances, including one's living situation and safety net, some components may be more important than others, or at least provide a heightened level of concern. For example, a deaf blind, uh, a deaf or hard of hearing person may have issues with um, emergency notifications, both in terms of um, prior to the disaster and being provided with information at shelters. Uh, a deaf and hard of hearing person may also have uh, an inability to evacuate on their own. Um, similarly, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have issues with notification and evacuation as well. Um, they and, and they may um, be able to be provided with information through their own living situations, or they may not. Um, as a blind person, um, I, too, have issues in um, the various segments of the emergency operations plan. I, I think I am fairly able to obtain emergency notifications through the various sources that we have nowadays, although nothing is certain. Um, I certainly have issues in the process of um shelter services with respect to making sure that i have all the information that is posted in written fashion with respect that i know how to get around the shelter um, and, and some other issues but i think that for me um the issue that i'm going to focus on today and i'll tell you why in a second is the evacuation component and there's two main reasons uh, one is personal um i have five children uh, three of them live far away from me, and they're obviously not going to be of any help to my wife and I, who are both blind, to evacuate. Um, one lives fairly close to me, but she happens to have two minor children, and her first uh, responsibility is obviously to evacuate her family. The final one has no minor children, but she does have two adult children in the household. And it is really uncertain as to whether she would be able to evacuate my, my wife and I um, in, in terms of a timely fashion, depending upon the circumstances of the emergency that might befall us. So for me, evacuation is, of course, extremely important. Moreover, the reason I'm going to focus on evacuation uh, as we go on in, our, uh, in this panel is that I think in many ways evacuation is the most complex and difficult component to get a handle on for a number of reasons. Um, it involves a number of agencies. 
it involves um, getting estimates of uh, the numbers of people that need to be served that are often hard to do. Um, so it involves a large number of factors that I will uh, elucidate as I go on. But it's a crucial element of the plan and definitely so for people with access and functional needs, many of whom, perhaps most of whom, do not have uh, are, are transit dependent and do not have modes of transportation available to them. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. So, you know, what, what I really want to do is just kind of dive in. Let's just have a dialogue here. So, Sanan, you know, I got a question for you. I know that in your time as an emergency manager in LA County, you've tackled what, I mean, wildfires, storms, earthquakes, you've, you've kind of done it all. Can you walk us through what are some of the evacuation related challenges that the county runs up against when they're trying to meet the needs of the whole community? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Vance. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for that question. Uh, I, I want to say I, I can actually add tornadoes to that list as well, because we did have one in Montebello. So one of the few emergency managers in L.A. that can say they responded to a tornado. Tornadoes uh, and probably fire natives, right, as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we have a lot of emergencies everywhere, right? In L.A. County, uh, we are under an extended heat advisory at this moment. I mean, uh, I'm the manager on duty right now, and I can say we're one spark away from a bad day, right? Uh, we've faced challenges before. I am not going to be up here saying that, hey, L.A. County, things are perfect. Everything is settled. Uh, we have had challenges related to emergency communication, providing robust communication in hard to reach areas during evacuations. I mean, the county is mountains, the county is canyons, the county is valleys. Uh, but there are areas that are hard to get to. Uh, there are passes that are difficult to navigate day to day, uh, let alone in an emergency when people are trying to evacuate. Uh, getting accessible vehicles in the past was a big challenge for the county, uh, especially with, in coordination with 88 cities that are in the county. I mean, trying to get everyone on board is a difficult task. Um, the biggest solution on how we overcame these challenges, that's what I really want to focus on. And uh, the credit to that goes to our community partners. Uh, our community partners really stepped up to the plate and our AFN partners specifically, our AFN stakeholders, allowed us to do a gap assessment with them at the table. Okay. Uh, this led to a much more robust outcome. For example, uh, getting emergency evacuation notices out. We were able to deploy uh, NOAA radios for emergency evacuation notification. That's a recommendation that really came out of our AFN group. Okay. Uh, building these robust partnerships and building an open dialogue really allowed our AFN stakeholders, uh, AFN advocacy groups to come to us with solutions. Uh, when it comes to evacuation itself, our partnership with Access Services, which is our paratransit provider, uh, really became incredibly important. Uh, we were able to work with them during most incidents. Uh, they would provide vehicles to evacuate individuals. They already had a list in place. We also worked with our public health partners to get a list of individuals that were energy dependent, that may need evacuation assistance. We would call them. Uh, and then the county is invested heavily in Zone Haven. Uh, Zone Haven is a system that really allowed us and the community really with uh, critical evacuation updates, deploy resources, coordinate large scale evacuation. Uh, I would like to say the biggest thing though is uh, the commitment of both our AFN stakeholders and the OEM team to really empower communities. Uh, OEM undertook an initiative to empower our communities by investing in local emergency management task forces, uh, such as the one in Topanga Canyon. These are community-led, community-run, and government agency, especially OEM, is there more as a consultant to provide support where needed. 
Uh, our long-term goal in developing these communities, and our goal is to have uh, multiple in each supervisorial districts. COVID has given us a little bit of a setback, but we're trying to reinvigor that project. Uh, our goal really is to have these communities be able to provide input in both planning efforts and then lead exercises, especially evacuation drills in their community. These happen every year in Topanga, and we would really like to see that expand countywide. You know, it's interesting to, to hear all the different points you touched on. It seems like that common thread is the partnership between emergency managers and individuals with access and functional needs. And I love that, right? Because that, that partnership is something that whether or not you've got a lot of resources or you don't have resources, if you've got that discussion and dialogue, uh, if there's a relationship there, everything you do is going to be a better product. And Tyler, that kind of got me thinking a little bit about, you, know, you, you talked a little bit about uh, communities having limited access to accessible transportation. And in thinking about what Sanan was saying, that they learned a lot by working with their AFM stakeholders. I know that in working with your AFM stakeholders, you, you're learning a lot and emergency managers are getting a, a broader view of the realities of, of what some of those uh, shortcomings might be on, on accessible transportation. Are there other examples that you're learning that maybe highlight some of the emergency evacuation challenges that people with access to functional needs face during disasters? Yeah, absolutely, Vance, thank you. You know, um, after our first big atmospheric river event um, that you know I discussed earlier, in Northern Nevada, uh, one of our community members reached out to me and my partner, Kimberly. Um, she's my counterpart at the Nevada Governor's Council for Developmental Disabilities. And she wanted to meet with us both to talk about, you know, her experience for her family um, during that event. She's a very active uh, community member, um, you know, but she's also a wheelchair user. And her husband is a wheelchair user, you know, and, you know, when that winter storm hit, um, they lost power and they were extremely scared and concerned about the freezing temperatures and their ability, um, you know, to maintain their body temperatures. They had seen a press release go out, you know, um, advertising that a warming shelter was opening, um, but the press release didn't have or state whether or not uh, the warming shelter was accessible. So they were very hesitant um, to wait out into the winter conditions if they didn't even know they, you know, they would be able to access this building because it, it was a building in their community, you know, they weren't really familiar with. Um, this couple did have a vehicle, um, so they did have transportation if they needed it, you know, but they encountered some other challenges as well, such as when the power went out, um, their automatic garage door opener stopped working and they weren't able um, you know, to manually lift the garage door. And even if they had, um, you know, the winter snow had was falling so quickly and building up so rapidly, um, you know, it really impeded their ability to exit their driveway. And if you haven't navigated, um, you know, in a wheelchair before, you might not be aware that even two inches of snow um, can really make a path inaccessible. And I really, you know, wanted to highlight their particular story um, because it's very important, you know, emergency managers understand that planning with the disability community um, really strengthens our evacuation planning. And when you include them in your planning, you know, you're going to get those lived experiences and guidance in your plans um, that are really going to help you build towards accessible solutions um, that offer uh, an entire range and cover more than just, you know, um, ramps or lifts in our public transportation. Um, you know, some of the guidance you're, and feedback you're gonna get when you're planning with these communities is, you know, do you have safety belts and wheelchair tie downs? Um, can people choose whether they wanna be transfer, transferred, you know, from their seat um, or remain in their wheelchair? You know, are your public transportation drivers um, educated on how to safely secure a wheelchair user? Um, do your first responders have that just-in-time training 
that they need to ensure they're evacuating people, you know, with their assistive equipment. So, you know, these are just a few things to really consider. Um, and one of the benefits that you're going to see when you plan and actively engage these communities, uh, especially around evacuation. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Heather. Um, you know, Jeff, you had talked, and, and at one point we had discussed, I think, offline about steps that local jurisdictions should take to operationalize evacuation plans, right? And specifically, uh, uh, evacuation plans that address the needs of people with access to a bunch of considerations. Um, any any thoughts on that? Like, what steps do you think local jurisdictions should take to move forward on that front? Yeah, I think the the question that needs to be answered and can be answered when a when a plan is uh, appropriately operationalized is that a person with an access and functional needs can have a general idea of how he or she will be evacuated. Obviously, you know, no system is going to be foolproof and, you know, you, you can't anticipate all the circumstances that might occur. But you should have some understanding of what may happen in, in your particular case. Now, this is a very complex um, set of uh, of variables to undertake to operationalize, as uh, we as we have just heard from our prior two you know panelists. But first, I think you need to have a good estimate of the number of transit dependent individuals that in the jurisdiction, um, and and that is not easy because you know some some jurisdictions I know use. Um, estimates of public social services recipients. But obviously, this is not inclusive enough. Some use um, lists of paratransit individuals, but many people are either not eligible um, be because of various reasons or do not choose to use paratransit. So it's a complex um, set of circumstances and it requires real planning throughout the jurisdiction to come up with a fairly um, reasonable estimate of how much you need in terms of resources to evacuate the communities within a particular jurisdiction. After that, you have to have a good analysis of the resources available for transporting the various elements of the transit-dependent population. Obviously, some people are going to need uh, accessible vehicles, others are not. Um, you have some that can be evacuated through congregate living arrangements and others that are spread out through the community um, in individual residential settings. So you need to take a look at uh, all that when you look at the resources you have. When you look at your resources, um, I think it's important not just to look at your um, fixed route and paratransit agencies, but also um, also, those outside your jurisdiction, because you're probably not going to have enough resources to evacuate everybody, as well as the private providers um, in both rural areas and urban areas, there are private providers of transportation that can be there to fill the gaps. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit on some really key things there. And, you know, one of the things, too, is that, that notion that there's going to be more people that, that have to have transportation. Probably then there are going to be transportation resources to, to deploy. Um, and I think that's when things like the outreach that you and Sanan and, and Heather have been talking about really factors in as well, right? Is to, to better understand you know, what are the needs and how do you address those needs. Um, I think some places have had a difficult go trying to reach out and engage with their stakeholders. I'm wondering, Heather, your, your program is, is relatively new, um, but I know that you've been doing a lot in terms of outreach. What advice or, or, or steps would, would you share or give in terms of ways to conduct outreach and ways to engage so that 
you can better understand and address evacuation challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I know there are probably um, a lot of people here today, um, maybe even from my rural and frontier states, um, who are trying to figure out, you know, how to start taking these significant steps in integration in their programs. Um, one of the biggest first projects uh, that we did internally here at the Nevada Division of Emergency Management, sorry, my lights are a little possessed today, I apologize, um, <laughs> is, uh, you know, we partnered with um, the DD Council or the Nevada Governor's Council for Developmental Disabilities um, to really reach out and create a coalition of disability service providers, um, you know, government, non-government agencies, advocacy agencies, uh, groups, you know, led by and for individuals with disabilities and access and functional needs. Um, and that group is called the Nevada Access and Functional Needs Disaster Coalition. You know, part of the function or role of that group is to provide the Division of Emergency Management not only direct access, um, you know, to our priority populations, but in reverse, uh, we get to plan with the community educational campaigns, you know, around evacuation best practices. Um, you know, one of the other big benefits of having this working group is I can provide, you know, real-time situational awareness to Nevada's, you know, Centers for Independent Living, um, caseworkers, community health nurses, child welfare caseworkers, you know, and caregivers. And I really wanted um, to highlight this particular uh, planning effort and work group and outreach because, um, you know, like many of my role in frontier states, you know, Nevada is not overly resourced, um, you know, like some of our sister states are, but that doesn't mean um, we can't be impactful. You know, this work group is about relationships, situational awareness, amplifying and pre our preparedness, education messaging, and having that direct access and incorporation, um, you know, and really having people that are gonna be directly in charge of uh, and responsible for evacuating our assisted living facilities and communities, um, you know, be in these planning process with us. You know, I was able um, to activate this group for the first time during one of the darkest moments in our recent disasters. And it was dark because uh, the power was out. Um, but to connect, you know, our, um, as our, and coordinate with our assisted living and long-term care facilities to one, you know, make sure all of the facilities in the impacted area, uh, you know, knew where their emergency operating plan was um, and how to activate it. But if they did need to evacuate, they understood those processes. You know, we were also able um, through the support of our, amaz our amazing um, division of aging and disability to share real-time information with caseworkers for Nevadans uh, who are living independently in the impacted areas, you know, so they could conduct welfare checks and share priority information, you know, and all of these efforts um, were really just good, inclusive planning and action. Uh, so I really want to encourage you not to hesitate um, or think because your budget or resources are limited that that limits your ability to make impacts and engage um, significantly with the disability and access and functional needs uh, community in your jurisdiction or state. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I want to thank people. I know there's a couple of questions that have been submitted uh, through the Q&A feature. And one of the things that I want to say for everybody listening on this is please submit whatever questions you have. There's no way we're going to have time to answer all of them right now. But one of the things we're going to do is whatever question comes in, after the symposium, we're going to get it answered. And then following the symposium, we'll get responses out to everybody. So even if your question doesn't get answered right now in this session, we will get a response for you. Uh, so please fill up our, uh, our Q&A here, and, and we'll make sure you get answers. Sanan, yeah, I wanted to ask, and it it's kind of leans on what Heather was talking about. But kind of two things. I mean, you you had all that experience running the AFN Advisory Committee. And what I want to know is, one, how did you build trust? Right, Because I know that that was a challenge. Um, can you talk about how you built trust? And then two, once that trust was established, how did you see that 
benefit the evacuation considerations or planning you were doing? So it's a two-parter. Okay, so uh, I would say the first part is fairly loaded. Um, building trust is is difficult, right? But I mean, uh, trust is important in all aspects. Uh, think about any relationship you've had. Uh, that relationship just can't be transactional. I mean, you're not going to get anything of value out of it. Um, and it, it's true. It takes forever to build trust. Uh, it takes years and years, uh, and it can be lost in seconds, right? Uh, my recommendation to building trust uh, would, would definitely be multi-pronged. There is no one way to do it. There is no one right way to do it. Uh, First one would really be reach out to your AFN community, its advocates, stakeholders, and provide them a forum, okay? This forum needs to be to have an open dialogue uh, with all stakeholders, including uh, your non-AFN stakeholders. Bring everyone to the table, okay? And don't take the message that they bring to you as criticism, okay? Think of it as gaps that have been brought to your attention, okay, that need to be filled in order to have a successful response. Um, the other I would say is don't use your AFN stakeholders as rubber stamps to meet requirements, okay? Uh, nothing valuable is going to come from that, okay? Uh, don't just pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, Vance, I need your help on A. What do you think of this? Okay, don't just have a relationship where you're pinging them, you're pinging your partners just to get their ideas. I mean, it really needs to be a collaborative form. Involve them in the process, okay? Uh, building a meaningful relationship with your partners is going to go a long way. Uh, and you can do that in multiple ways. Go to their meetings, okay? Do your AFN stakeholders always have to just come to yours? Why can't you, as an emergency manager, as an AFN stakeholder, okay, go to theirs, okay? Uh, go to the events that community groups put up. Uh, set up time to meet their staff. Set up time to understand their process. Uh, the more you invest in building a relationship with your AFN stakeholders, the more you're going to get out of it. Uh, when I was the AFN, AFN coordinator for LA County, uh, I would have coffee meetups with uh, my AFN stakeholder group partners. Uh, it would just be one-on-one. -on -one. How are you doing? Uh, I found out uh, one of my colleagues from uh, Greater Los Angeles Agency of Deafness uh, was a huge bike rider. I'm a huge bike rider. We would meet up on the weekends just to ride. Uh, I mean, building meaningful partnerships, building meaningful relationships is what you are going to be able to count on in the middle of an emergency. Okay. And all of that, 100% of it, is based on trust. That's interesting, Sanan, because you could be talking about building a relationship uh, in terms of developing a friendship with someone. You could be talking about building a relationship of professional trust. You could be talking about a relationship uh, with your spouse, right? Yeah. But what I'm hearing is put in the time, be sincere. In, have two-way engagement. Um, so yeah, all those principles still apply. And I and I, I love, by the way, what you said about don't just check a box, right? Because I think we've all experienced that, right? Where I, you know when somebody's just going through the motions and it, it feels condescending and it does not build trust. It's, it's uh, insulting if I'm being honest. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when you talk about stakeholders, give us an example, like who are some of the stakeholders? Uh, because I know a lot of people out there are wondering, well, this sounds great, but who do I call? Is it is it like a local paratransit? Is that a stakeholder? Uh, is it yeah, so para sorry to interrupt you, Vance. No, uh, no, no, go ahead. So paratransit is a stakeholder, but I wouldn't say that's the primary AFN stakeholder group. Uh, I'm talking more specifically about AFN advocacy groups, uh, groups that do mental health advocacy, our independent living centers, our uh, development disability coordinating, uh, coordinating bodies, uh, physical disability coordinating groups, uh, Greater Los Angeles Agency on Deafness, uh, the Braille Institute is here in Los Angeles. So, uh, and 
you know, there is no one directory, right, where you can go and pick up the or go to their website and say, oh, these are the list of all AFN stakeholder groups that are in LA County. It would be great if that existed, but it doesn't. Uh, it took a lot of searching uh, online. It took a lot of searching on Facebook groups. Uh, it took a lot of word of mouth where after our initial meeting, uh, we found out from uh, Westside Center for Independent Living shared with us that, hey, there is this amazing veterans group that supports veterans with disabilities. You know, a lot of it can be word of mouth. Not every AFN stakeholder group is going to have a big website, is going to have a big coordinating group to reach out and work with. These are individuals who have committed their lives and uh, to the AFN community. And there is a lot of work to do on that side, right? Uh, so you want to make sure that you reach out to these smaller groups as well. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the groups that became a part of our uh, Emergency Management Advisory Council, which was our, uh, AFN, uh, our AFN advisory group, uh, really came to us word of mouth. They didn't have fancy websites. So don't ignore the smaller groups. Those relationships are just as important because uh, going back to the second part of your question, Vance, I mean, uh, if you push out an evacuation message, right? And a trust doesn't exist, okay? That message is gonna have a lower uptake. But then if you have AFN groups that re-emphasize their message, they amplify your message to their stakeholders, because they are that trusted agency, that message will have uh, a higher uptick. Now, by that, I don't mean don't try to build trust with the community. Don't mean that at all. What I mean is you do have these stakeholders that can be very, very valuable partners to help you build that trust with the community. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Anand. Um, in California, a law was passed, it's on the Bill 580, that says that all the counties have to submit their emergency operation plans on the next update uh, to OES. And, and, and what we do is we look at them and ensure that in part, they're aligning, not just with the, the laws associated with inclusion and integration, but also with best practices. And Jeff, I know that you know, you provide a lot of value. You're on the team that, that works with us to look at the evacuation sections of those plants. Uh, and I'm wondering from your perspective, having done this and looked at multiple plans, yeah, you know, are you seeing that that there's some some common threads um, or or uh, challenges? that communities are having on the evacuation side? And if so, what kind of recommendations are you giving out? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> as I stated earlier, the, the biggest issue from my perspective and the one that's common to most emergency operation plans, including the evacuation um, annexes to those plans, is the fact that the level of detail for how evacuation procedures are going to occur really doesn't exist. Um, LA County appears to be a model, um, but um, it, it, it is really necessary to have uh, a high level of detail in terms of you know, where you're going to have what resource and applying to which population uh, and which areas of the county. Um, you you need to uh, have uh, enough training uh, drills so that people understand what is going to happen to them um, during an evacuation. Um, there is very little planning in terms of uh, making individuals understand that there are insufficient resources. And in addition to using community-based organizations, Things like PSAs and social media can help um, people with access and functional needs and their um, loved ones design alternative evacuation plans uh, for themselves to um, supplement the resource limitations that you have 
in in the uh, applicable jurisdiction. So, uh, and, and finally, of course, and we've just been discussing it, we need to have more input from the access and functional needs community. And a lot of that input, when it comes from uh, training drills themselves, can actually identify problems that no one will anticipate. And I think that these training drills should also try to apply to specific populations because different populations will present different issues. Um, I know that in my county, um, a blindness organization received a grant to do um, emergency preparedness education and training. And similar grants should be uh, available to regional centers and um, independent living centers and you know mental health advocacy groups. Because as I say, um, we need to find, find out the specific issues that we're going to face before the emergencies occur. Yeah, I love that you said before they occur, right? Let's not wait for the balloon to go up. Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, I'll say, and I'm gonna put in sort of a little bit of shameless plug here. Uh, Calaris is gonna be coming out with an evacuation guidance. And I expect that that'll be released in just the next couple of weeks. And some of the things that, that are included in there speak directly to points that you brought up, Jeff. Right, and I'm going back to that notion about there's going to be more people that need accessible transportation than there are accessible resources to deploy. And so what we're putting out there as guidance is for jurisdictions to develop uh, contracts with accessible transportation providers within their jurisdiction, but to then develop contracts with vendors outside of their jurisdiction as well, right? That recognition that there's gonna to have to be a surge capacity. And if those contracts, to your point, aren't established beforehand, it's gonna impede progress during the event. The other thing that we're including in there among recommendations and guidance is to work with the AFN community and find out how do you receive your emergency information, right? Is it through alerting and, and, and how do you communicate with emergency management? And when it comes to evacuation specifically, to come up with uh, a number, if you will, that people can call to get emergency evacuation uh, assistance. Right, because what happens is we set up these contracts and we think it's all good, but then you know, okay, Jeff needs emergency evacuation transportation, and does Jeff know what number to call? Right, how does the end user actually take advantage of this? Um, and rather than change the phone number every fire or every flood, or every event, just have one consistent way that people can use regardless of the disaster. And then to use the AFN advisory committee to socialize that throughout the community, right? We all know that if we call 911, that's how you get police or fire or EMS. I doubt that many people, if anyone on this line, could tell you what number to call to get emergency evacuation assistance. But that needs to change. So uh, those are some of the best practices that will be included in that guide. Then we'll make sure it gets pushed out far and wide. I want to use that idea about best practices as a springboard, Heather, to go back to you because I know that especially following the winter storms, that the virus has been making a lot of progress on this issue. And what I'm wondering is if you can share with us some of the successes uh, and maybe best practices that you're seeing in Nevada on emergency evacuation. 
customer because I think people can take a lot from it. Yeah, absolutely, Vance. Thank you. Um, you know, I really can't stress enough uh, the importance of layering and leveraging your resources and your relationships, but really take it to the max. You know, um, our DD Council, like I mentioned before, not only partners with us um, on our disaster coalition, but they're also in the office with me every Friday in person, um, you know, helping to plan joint preparedness projects and have that direct outreach and feedback from the disability community. They're on coordination calls with me, even if it's 1 a.m. in the morning. Um, you know, we're involving our Centers for Independent Living um, and representatives from our aging and disability divisions. Uh, they really have to be in the room with you where it's happening. Um, you know, I'm currently working internally to kind of examine and evaluate uh, if we need to expand our emergency support functions uh, to officially include some of these agencies, you know, that we just discussed. So, you know, as we're planning and exercising and responding, you know, they're right there with us um, and having them at that emergency support level function, um, that piece really makes it sustainable. So even if, for instance, you know, there was any type of budgeting issues with me or my position, um, you know, you're not losing that progress. Uh, you know, it's part of the system, um, you know, and I'm not going to say um, any of this when you're starting a program like this, uh, it's easy um, and that it doesn't take extensive time and effort. In some cases, you know, it is hard, um, but nothing is more necessary. And, you know, since Vance, we're kind of on the topic of relationships, you know, I did want to briefly highlight how important it is um, you know, our relationship with our sister states, uh, you know, during the Caldor fire, for instance, um, when Californians were evacuating with their families and their animals um, across state lines into Nevada, that really helped us identify, you know, some internal gaps. Um, but some of those gaps included, you know, we didn't know our California counterparts and their processes as well as we probably should have. And that caused you know, some coordination challenges and delays in services, um, you know, but one of the things we did together was, um, you know, once that was over, we met up at the border of California and Nevada, and we really sat down um, and started to hash out those expectations, you know, and start building those communications for when this happens again. And of course, you know, with the way um, our wildfire seasons have expanded in California and Nevada, um, it will happen again. So, uh, our real gem this year was developing those resources um, and developing those that trust and direct contacts uh, with our disability communities here in Nevada. Um, and it has really, really helped improve um, all of our evacuation planning um, and help kind of hone in on what we need to target and really close down on, um, you know, in this next coming year in cycles. Awesome. Thanks, Heather. So now I'm going to come back to you and I'm, I'm going to ask, I like giving you these two parters, right? Keep you on your toes. Um, so the, the first part of play best practices, things you've learned on this issue that you think emergency managers across the, the states should know. Um, you know if you've got a, a, a point or two um, or 12. And then the other part of that is really kind of what, uh, you know, what what Heather was going to in terms of uh, that, that dynamic with the community and making sure that you've got relationships with other jurisdictions. LA County is huge. A lot of people come into LA County when bad things happen in their jurisdictions. So um, maybe just kind of on, on both fronts and, and maybe it all ties in well since learned. Uh, sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll tackle the, uh, the easy one first. Uh, some of the best practices, uh, I would say invest in relationships, invest in the community, build bridges, uh, make time for your uh, EFN partners and stakeholders outside of meetings. Uh, I have had, I've been through, and I'm sure all of you are in the same boat, we have like death by PowerPoint meetings, it's two hours long, and I mean, we've accomplished very little. Uh, and then over a 30 minute quick lunch or coffee, uh, you've accomplished a lot more. So I'm sure we've all been to those. So 
try to make time outside of meetings for your AFN partners, get to know them, avoid transactional relationships, uh, and make sure their voice is heard. So with our uh, AFN uh, committee, what we used to do is uh, they were a we, we would break them out into subcommittees for uh, planning efforts, right? Whether it's planning for an exercise, whether it's planning to develop a plan uh, or a new initiative, whatever else it may be. And we would uh, collect their input as a part of the planning process and then present it to the whole community, uh, to the whole committee, okay? The committee had the opportunity to make recommendations we would require the owner of that plan, the owner of that exercise, the owner of that initiative, regardless of which county department it was, to come back and share how those recommendations were integrated. I mean, that traffic of information flow needs to be going both ways, right? Uh, there is no point getting input if it's not being integrated. So we wanted to make sure that the committee understood their value, they were empowered, uh, and I'm going to uh, echo Jeff's sentiment. One of the things that Jeff said that really resonates is do this before the emergency happens. This is really a best practice to build trust, making sure the, com the community knows their voice is heard. Okay. Uh, in terms of reaching across jurisdictional boundaries, uh, I, I think I said that earlier, LA County, uh, is is a beast when it comes to jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, we have 88 cities. We have, uh, oh, I think we have like three or 400 special districts. Uh, we have multiple critical infrastructure partners. Uh, we have federal lands, state lands. Uh, it, it, there are a lot of complexities of planning across jurisdictions, but that doesn't mean we can't do it, uh, especially when it comes to uh, rate limiting resources, ASL interpreters, very difficult to come by, especially those that can uh, do interpretation of emergency management terminology. Okay, uh, there are times when I'm I'm not a native English speaker. I, you know, I speak Hindi at home. It it's one of those where there are times when I have a difficult time translating from one to the other. Right. Uh, so it, it's not always easy. So making sure you have competent ASL providers can be difficult, okay? But there are so few of them. Now imagine every city in the county, 88, LA County, our neighboring counties, all of us competing for the same resource. And we have one large earthquake that impacts all of us, okay? How is that critical resource going to be apportioned? Okay. And I mean, that's a planning that needs to happen early on. Uh, we've had success with paratransit. Uh, we have a local uh, group that we've put together called Transmac. Uh, it involves local uh, transit providers that also have paratransit vehicles, accessible vehicles. Uh, and this group becomes the coordinating body uh, when one of them is impacted on how accessible vehicles are going to be provided. So make sure you have that as a part of the discussion early on. Uh, the most important is cost. Uh, cost sharing across jurisdictional boundaries is a problem. So when you're discussing MOUs with your jurisdictional partners, keyword jurisdictional partners, not your AFN stakeholders, okay, make sure that you're talking about cost and how cost sharing is going to work. Because I have seen MOUs fall apart real time because cost wasn't discussed early on. In the middle of the emergency is not the time to discuss that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've got about eight minutes left. Uh, I want to know really kind of two things. One, then Heather, I'm going to come to you on this, and then I'm going to ask everybody um, a separate question. So, so Heather, what's the role of the individual? Right. In other words, we we're going to push on our government partners, and they need to stretch. But when it comes to personal evacuation planning, yeah, that, that key personal, right? What's the role of the individual? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the, the most important aspects of this is to have, I think, very 
frank and hard conversations, not just with ourselves as emergency managers, but you know, with our communities um, and within our own families and friend groups as well. Because the truth is, you know, help is coming, but it's not coming immediately, you know, and in some cases and places, um, it might not even be coming for a week. Um, so it's very, very important, you know, we never stop talking about this with our communities, um, you know, but really, we have to support the community um, to understand what preparedness looks like for me and my family is going to be much different uh, than what it might look like for you and yours, you know, and really dive into topics like, you know, have you established a multi-person support team, um, you know, not just one buddy or caregiver that you rely on. Um, do you need practice maybe um, with this, you know, developing that skill of giving quick information on how to best help you um, to first responders, you know, have you planned uh, multiple ways of getting information out to your support network? You know, that classic, um, you know, make a plan, pack a bag, be ready to go. It's just not gonna cut it um, in today's disasters landscape. You know, we have to go much deeper with our communities and really dive into, um, you know, how we provide targeted and accessible uh, preparedness information, you know, which allows our communities to make those actionable and relevant preparedness decisions for them. And that includes, you know, conversations around how you do this with limited resources. Um, that has to be one of the key pieces of these conversations when we're, you know, helping and supporting um, our community members to, to own that individual preparedness piece. 100%. Uh, you know, I've got this thing we always say come up with five people on your support network uh, that you can count on or rely on uh whether that's you know a, a spouse a family member a, a friend a colleague neighbor whoever it is um now i want to know in our last five minutes we'll just go around the horn um what do you see as the next big steps needed to make significant progress on this issue, right? I mean, uh, if you could wave the magic wand and have A, B, or C get implemented, what, what's the next big step? Um, Jeff, what's the next big step? So I would say two things to that. <clears throat> First, although I can't predict exactly what's going to happen, I think that due to the increase in uh, emergencies that we are seeing and the severity of those disasters, I think you're going to see more mandatory requirements, perhaps even from the federal level, but certainly um, enacted by states over the next you know decade or so. I think too that I'd like to see um, one would be more mandatory requirements on transit agencies public transit agencies uh, to perform all the duties required in the evacuation sphere, because it varies a lot uh, from um, place to place. And secondly, I think that there needs to be um, a greater degree of uh, consistency among jurisdictions in terms of the degree to which they regulate and determine compliance uh, for shelters uh, many of which, perhaps a majority of which, are private in nature. All right, and sheltering is one of the panels we'll get into tomorrow, so that'll be a, a good deep dive there. Uh, Sanan, big steps. What, uh, what's next? Uh, so I would definitely say continue to empower communities. Uh, I, I think that's a never ending task, right? Uh, you want to make sure that your stakeholders are valued. These relationships can deter, can, you can, can break down very quickly. So continue to empower your communities. Uh, for me, that really is paramount. Uh, I'm going to echo uh, one of the things that Jeff said, though. There are some legislative needs that need to be pushed a bit further. Uh, especially around evacuation and sheltering. Uh, I think we have quite a bit of parameters that guide communication and emergency notifications. I would like to see something similar around evacuations and mass sheltering. 
All right. Heather, what's next? Um, I am also going to echo Jeff um, in one of his previous uh, comments about uh, we've got to do better um, allocating funding to our centers for independent living um, so that they can prepare uh, and really do that outreach themselves and we were empowering them. Um, I'd also like to really quickly highlight, you know, we have several states um, that still do not have dedicated access and functional needs coordinators, you know, helping to integrate their, their access and functional needs communities into their disaster planning and coordination and enterprise. Um, so that's got to become a standard. Uh, and those are kind of my two big uh, magic wand waves. Fantastic. All right, look, it's been a great discussion. Uh, I could sit and talk with all of you for much, much longer. Thank you for lending us your expertise and your perspective. Um, we got a ton of questions that came in. I'm going to send those to each of you, and we'll get responses, and then we're going to send out those responses to everybody that registered. So if, uh, if you didn't get your question answered, it will be answered. And if you didn't submit a question, feel free to put one in. And with that, I'm going to officially close out this panel and say thank you very much, Heather. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Sanan. Uh, then I invite you to go ahead and turn your cameras off and enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you, Van. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.